couple of things I failed to mention to you in our prayer time. Let me take care of that now. Ken, not feeling well, so home a bit under the weather, uh, recuperating, but would appreciate our prayers. And uh, Bill and Rose Snyder, who worship with us in second service, uh, Bill's just wrapped up about six and a half weeks of chemo and radiation for some lung cancer and uh, is kind of recuperating from that process and looks like we'll be uh, doing immunotherapy, uh, a, a session of that which lasts sort of indefinitely. Uh, they would appreciate your prayers really just week after trying to get better. You've seen enough of that to understand a little about what that's like. I don't know if you noticed, um, as we're working our way through Romans, uh, I, I admitted to you last week, struggling my way through the first half of chapter 7, and it ended on a rather difficult note, uh, sort of leading us in the direction that the commandment came that sin would be utterly sinful, just uh, exceedingly and beyond measure. <clears throat> the, the purpose of the law was to show us just how far we missed the mark. And so that section kind of ended like a, oh, gosh. And maybe you felt, as I struggled to try to, how do we relate to that? But if that was the case about the first half of chapter 7, I think you probably will feel much more connection to the second half of chapter 7. Um... As it is a, a reality that we all just kind of live in, in the day to day. So we're going to just read our way through Romans chapter 7, starting verse 14. <clears throat> For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I'm not practicing what I would like to do. But I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, <clears throat> I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully confer with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? <clears throat> Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Let's pray a minute. Father, Paul is so very elegant and thorough in his explanation of the struggle that we face in the day to day. Longing to follow Jesus and and to serve him faithfully, having that desire within, and yet seems as if these actions and things just take us in other directions. Help us to learn from Paul's transparency here of this struggle and to, to, to settle into what appears to be his first attempt at the solution to that tension that we live in. Teach us, Father, from your word this morning. Through your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. And amen.
A developmental psychologist at Penn State University ran an experiment. She took a large group of kids, fed them a big lunch, and then she turned them loose in a room filled with junk food. So there's, they're not hungry, right? But suddenly they're turned loose with a whole room full of junk food. She says, what we see is that some kids eat almost nothing, but other kids really chow down. And the one thing that predicts how much they eat of the junk food is the extent to which the parents have restricted their access to high fat, high sugar food in the past. The more the kids have been restricted, the more they eat. Burgess study also discovered one reason this happened. The children on restricted diets believed the junk food tasted good primarily because they had been told that junk food was bad for them. <laughs> How many of you can tear into, maybe this is just me, how many of you can tear into a bag of Lay's potato chips and just wipe that bad boy out? <laughs> you know? Knowing you should not. Man, they taste good. How come, how come we don't have that same attraction to broccoli? <laughs> now I know some of you do have and have developed that tendency, but we're back m &Ms. It just seems boom, 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 boom. It's just, uh, wait a minute, how did that sack get empty already? And as I, as I read over that, it was, hey, wait a minute. Isn't that exactly what the Apostle Paul was talking about in the second half of Romans chapter 7? I know what I ought to be doing. I know who I am. And yet, I seem to end up in all these other places all the time doing these things that I don't really want to do and they just seem to come so naturally and so easy. And the things that I ought to be or want to be doing, man, just seem like a struggle all the time. And that's what Paul's talking about here is that tension that exists. He was honest enough with us to tell us at the end that the law's purpose was to show us how utterly sinful we are in reality, how how our tendency is to be so unlike God. And yet once we have been reconciled to him, there is within us then that longing, that desire to be just like him. But it doesn't come without struggle. Now there is some debate that has gone on forever about this text as to whether or not Paul's talking about his experience before he came to Christ or his experience after he came to Christ. And I'm not smart enough to settle that debate for us for myself personally. I just see some hints. For instance, just, you know, in verse 22, he says, for I joyfully confer with the law of God in the inner man. And, and on down he says, uh, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. Those are just a couple of examples of statements that only someone who has come to Christ, who has been born again, could possibly make. Because those are not statements that, that I would have made before coming to Christ. You remember how Paul described us, and, and we all relate in, in chapter 3. No need to project this. This is just when Paul's doing a rapid-fire quote of Old Testament. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. And he goes on and on. There's no fear of God in their eyes. That was sort of a, a, a rapid fire summation of what it's like before we come to Christ. But then a couple of those hints in this text seem to say, oh, but there is this dichotomy now. There is this reality that I'm still struggling to apply everything that I am now. But man, I sure want to. There is that longing in me to follow after him and to do it the way he wants to do it. But it's a battle, yes? Constant day in and day out, we are aware of that struggle. And although the battlefields change as time go along, you know, the arenas in which we make those struggles, they change, sort of, from outward behaviors 
And then it just seems as we make progress, we, we make some progress on these outward behaviors, but then just the battlefront, the arena just moves inward and it becomes much more with our thoughts and our attitudes and our motives. But we, the struggle is still there and still very real. And that's what Paul is, is addressing there. And I think sometimes the adversary will convince, try to convince us that because there is that ongoing struggle, there's something wrong with us. You, you've obviously missed it because you're still struggling. If, as I suspect Paul is relating to his own experience, even, even after having come to Christ, it is, it is reality and will continue to be all the way home. Let me refer to that Galatians text, if I might. You know, here, Paul takes a half a chapter to say this. I think he sums up this concept for us in two verses in Galatians. He, he only wrote six chapters as opposed to 16 chapters, so he was being more concise. But he says here, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. It's significant to note he doesn't say you won't have the desire of the flesh. I think by insinuation he's suggesting they're still going to be there, but you're just not going to act on them. You will not carry them out. And then he goes on in verse 17, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Does that not sound like the second half of Romans chapter 7 in two simple verses? There's going to be opposition for us as followers of Jesus because in the midst of all of our brokenness, there has been an infusion of life and the infusion of that life intends to take over and dominate us progressively doing away with that old brokenness. But it is a process. And Paul is acknowledging that here. We are still going to have a tendency to desire and choose for that which we know is not the best for us. Let's work our way through a bit of this chapter 7 starting at verse 14 again. In, in, in verse 14 when he brings up that the law is spiritual but I am of flesh and so we get that, we, we've encountered that a number of times throughout Romans here as we've made our way through this. There, there are these two realities that we experience, that we encounter. There is the spiritual realm, the eternal, the unseen. And yet, also at the same time, there is the temporal, <clears throat> the flesh, the here and now. The problem is that here and now, experiences the control of sin, of our falling short of our brokenness. And so all the time, all of life is very much about those two realms and their interplay. And, and often finding themselves in opposition to each other. The more, the more we begin to interpret life with that dichotomy in place of the temporal and the eternal, of the physical and the spiritual, the more mindful we can be of, of, of the struggle that we find ourselves in and an intense struggle at times, as some of the wording will make clear. Look as he goes on, and then he just acknowledges verse 15. I, 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 what I'm doing, I don't understand. I don't, I don't get this, you know? I'm not doing what I'd like to do. I do the very thing I hate. How many of us haven't or, or can't relate to that? We don't want to feel that way. We don't want to act that way. We don't want to, why did I say that? Oh, you know, kind of thing. Why am I allowing these thoughts to just captivate me when I know that's not truth? That's what Paul's relating to. That's the reality of that conflict that's in place within us. And on into verse 16, it continues to go, as you heard me read, 
If I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. You know, he was helping in the first half of that chapter, he was helping the Jewish people come to terms with how they related to the law. And, and if the law or the, the statement of right and wrong was, was what put us in a position of knowing sin, is there something wrong with the law? And, and he's going out of his way to make sure, no, the law was God-given, the law is good, but it just affirms the fact that we don't get it right all the time, that we fall short, that we are sinners, that we are broken people, and we're still processing through that tension. And on to verse 17. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. It's almost as if he's trying to create a, a, a dichotomy within us, that there is this, this brokenness that dwells in me. <clears throat> Even though I have been born again, I have placed my faith in Christ, that brokenness still is there, still can dominate, still can influence who I am and, and what I do. Later on in the book of Romans, Paul is going to give us a little hint. At the end of chapter 13, he says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. So it's like there is this unwelcome entity within us. Paul says, well, there's a remedy for that. Starve it. <laughs> make no provision to the flesh, the brokenness that dwells within us. Don't entertain it. Don't give it a place. Don't feed it. And progress comes as a result. On to verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. Now, that's one of the phrases that sometimes would, would suggest that Paul's talking about before he came to Christ. But I think that's disallowed by, by what, his expansion. I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. Meaning our, 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 our present physical reality of this world, that in our, in our physical bodies, the, the, the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. That of my own, of my, of my human nature, there's a desire, but I just can't pull it off. how that speaks to so many conversations that I've had with people and no doubt that you have too want to get it right but on our own generated by trying harder or the best of intentions we just don't do it the willing as opposed to the doing in verse 19, the good that I want, I do not do, do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. That's a strong word. And yet compared to the holiness of God, it's accurate <clears throat> that we have the capacity to practice evil. We just created little categories, you know. We, we, we want there to be some sort of uh, category of, of evil that doesn't measure up with the, with the atrocities of evil that have been down through human history. But Paul's honest enough to say, I'm capable <clears throat> of practicing the very evil that I do not want. On into verse 20. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Almost as if he's trying to distance himself from that reality of brokenness that's within him. But it is there. And it is, it is 
It desires to be active and busy. Even though Paul has taught us and does in other places, we have been crucified. That our old man was crucified with Christ. That is a spiritual reality. But then it's, it's been left to us to apply that spiritual reality to our day-to-day -day living. David and I had a conversation this week about, about that notion of continuing to preach the gospel to ourselves. The gospel is not only a message that deals with the penalty of sin, meaning that we can't be reconciled with God, but it is also a message that day-to-day -day delivers us from the power of sin. When it would try to dominate us, to force us into actions that are not what we desire, and yet we seem powerless against them. But that same gospel message will free us from that power of sin. Jesus died for my sin. I have died to sin. I just have to appropriate that provision into my life today. Not just for a <clears throat> hope of heaven, you know, what a day that will be. That's going to be a grand day. But this day can be a grand day too. As we appropriate the power of the gospel in our lives in the here and now and keep that sin nailed to the cross where Jesus took it. We do not have to allow it to wreak havoc in our day-to-day -day living. It's there, and there's opposition. But we don't have to give in. We don't have to yield to that. On the verse 21, I find in the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. That may be a hard admission. We, we, we know and recognize evil out in the world. It's a, it's a label that we can apply to those. Maybe someone no further away than just someone who has a different opinion than us, or maybe someone who is guilty of incredible atrocities out there against humanity. We, we can label that with evil. But this is the prime theologian in our faith tradition. And he says, I've got to be honest with you. I find in me evil. I don't always want to do what God wants me to do. Evil. And yet, alongside of that, <clears throat> there is a desire to do good. Do you feel that tension day to day? And, and we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't categorize selfishness or greed or any of the other thing, the brokenness realities that we encounter day to day, we, we wouldn't want to categorize them as evil and yet... It's, it's seeking to rob God of his rightful place in our life, and that's what Paul's calling it here. It's in me. Even though at the same time I really want to do good, again, which is, which is why I lean toward Paul saying this is the ongoing reality, the struggle that he wrote about to the Galatians about how the two are in opposition to one another, the spirit and the flesh. Verse 22 continues, I joyfully confer with the law of God in the inner man. So there is that connection within us. There is that potential, that capacity that, that we can within us align with what God wants for us. And yet, verse 23, as he continues, but I see a different law in the members of my body. The, there is that old brokenness trying to work its way out in the realities of how I interact with people and do life in the here and now. There's a different law, it's, and it's waging war against the law of my mind. 
See, it was, it was the law of his, it was in his mind where he was joyfully conferring with the law of God. And yet in his, in his members, his physical body, his reality, his interaction with people and his doing of life, that there is a war raging, trying to make him a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in his members. That's its goal. To, to drag us back into that bondage of sin that, from which we have been set free if we will choose to appropriate it. It's like, you know, we, we, we were properly locked up in a cell, but then someone had made arrangements for us to be free and the door has been opened and, and there we are and we just choose to stay in the cell, <laughs> you don't have to be there. If we are there, prisoner to the law of sin, <clears throat> it is because we choose. Appropriation has been made otherwise. Verse 24, he finally just comes down to it wretched man that I am. On my own, on my own, I want to be the deal. I want to be the center of my little kingdom. I want everything to fall in my pleasant places. I want to be catered to. Paul in his born again state, having met Jesus on the road to Damascus, recognizes <laughs> that is a wretched state. There is no future in that. It is empty. It is dead. It is lifeless. And then he cries out, who will set me free from the body of this death? Reminded me of um, when Jesus came, was it the pool of Bethesda? Was that the one where he came up to the man who had been there all those years and said to him, you remember what he asked him? Do, do you want to get well? <laughs> and it's like the guy said, well, duh, you know. <laughs> I, once the water starts, I don't have anybody to get me in there in time. We have to get to the point where we're willing to recognize what a mess we're in before we're willing to humble ourselves to receive the solution to the mess that we're in. Paul, reflecting on that wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? And then he answers the question. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Where does our deliverance come from? In the midst of this war, what is the influence that shifts the outcome? Well, it's, it's Jesus. What he has already done for us, which Paul has been teaching us in those previous chapters. Chapter six was full about the impact of the crucifixion and the resurrection in our day-to-day -day lives. That's not just to get us to heaven, not just preparing us for a, what a day that will be, and that's going to be a wonderful day, but how about the here and now? Applicable here and now, it delivers us. It wins the war that is raging within us, between our flesh, our brokenness, and our mind, our spirit, our immaterial, that really longs to serve God do things the right way. And the solution every time is, is Jesus and our relationship with him.
Henry Nowen had this to say. He says, I cannot continuously say no to this or no to that unless there is something 10 times more attractive to choose. Saying no to my lust, my greed, my needs, and the world's powers takes an enormous amount of energy. The only hope is to find something so obviously real and attractive that I can devote all my energies to saying yes. One such thing I can say yes to is when I come in touch with the fact that I am loved. Once I have found that in my total brokenness, I am still loved, I become free from the compulsion of trying to succeed. Jesus loves us in spite of our brokenness, in spite of our struggle with the flesh and that nature that wants to set up a competing kingdom as opposed to serving his. Brings that war to an end. Dallas Willard had this to say, very similar thought. The surest guarantee against failure is to be so at peace and satisfied with God that when wrongdoing presents itself, it isn't even interesting. Satan counts on the fact that we are still vulnerable in our fallenness. And all he has to do is dangle the right bit of bait out there in front of us and we'll go for it. But as we begin to become so at peace and satisfied in our relationship with God made available to us through Jesus in his death and resurrection, it doesn't matter what gets presented to us. It's like why would I settle for that <laughs> when I've got this? And it renders powerless the assault of the adversary against us. This calls us to be consistently investing in our relationship with Jesus. Not settling for the multiplied distractions that are available all around us that says, hey, this will do it over here. Come for all of this. This, will, this is what you're looking for. And then we begin to recognize the fallacy, the inability of those distractions to actually provide what they're promising. And instead, we continue to come back to our relationship with Jesus as the only way to experience freedom from our brokenness and win that battle that's raging between the spirit and our flesh. To be so at peace and so satisfied in our relationship with him. It's all good. It's not even interesting. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what he makes available to us. He is there all the time. So that on the one hand, as he says, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. <clears throat> on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. It, the battle is still real. It is still all about us. It's up to us. It's up to us. I got an early morning text this week from a friend who's some combination of disappointed and heartbroken.
For he had learned that a, a distance mentor of his had chosen poorly and became yet again a long list of kingdom leaders who had fallen prey to his flesh. And, and this young man was just agonizing and disappointment. And I, I share that to remind you that no matter how long we've been at this, we must constantly be aware of the battle. Will the arenas change? You know, there are things that used to bug me that I used to fall prey to that <laughs> not anymore. It doesn't mean the battle is over. We must constantly be aware of it, raging around us all the time. That we have an adversary committed to our demise and he tries to launch his forays through our flesh, our bodies, our realities in this physical world. But I encouraged him that Jesus is enough. That's a brother who decided in that moment that Jesus wasn't enough, that he was going to get what he was looking for somewhere else. I said, let's be brothers who resolve not to go there. And let's finish well. So I call you to that saying, wherever the battle rages for you in this season of your life, Recognize that Jesus will meet you in the middle of that and he will be enough. He will meet you there and enable you to stand no matter how intense that battle becomes. And so you too will be able to join the Apostle Paul. Oh, wretched one that I am. Man, is this ever going to end? Who will deliver me? I know who delivers me. Jesus delivers me. And he will never fail. Amen. Amen. A young woman who, who apparently is well enough known that she goes by one name. Her name is Terrian. And she has a song. Honestly, we just need Jesus. Play that for us and I'll come back and close. <laughs> Tony Evans tells the story about uh, making his way through an airport one day and he was in a bit of a, a hurry. You know, he had to get to a gate and he didn't want to miss his plane. And man, he was pulling a bag and he was huffing and puffing and said, all of a sudden he was aware of a guy right next to him that wasn't exerting nearly as much effort, was going past him. And then he looked a little closer as one of those moving sidewalks. <laughs> and he likened that to the presence of the Holy Spirit. How we often try to get where we want to get in our own energies, our own strength. And we're huffing, we're puffing, and we're pulling a bag. When there are other resources available that can quicken our pace, the Holy Spirit is available to us all the time. He will make known Jesus to us in the midst of wherever we find ourselves. And I want to remind you too that it's not always about the pace. Because we usually want to, you know, get through something as quickly as possible. We want to... But there, there are different ways that he describes our Christian life. Sometimes he calls it a run. Run the race that is set before you. We like that. Quick, let's get this over with. Sometimes it says it's a walk. Often one of Paul's favorite descriptions of the Christian life is the walk. And then there are other times he says, stand. And it's to us to discern what sort of a season does he have us in in terms of our relationship with him. Is this just a time to stand in the midst of the circumstances and let him meet us there to make sure that we get everything that he has for us in that given moment? 
and not to hurry past because it's uncomfortable or it's tense, filled with tension. Sometimes just stand. And then there'll come a point where you say, okay, we're ready to move, but not too fast. You're not ready to run yet. Let's, let's walk a little together, hand in hand, away we go. And then there'll be seasons where it seems like, man, he's cut us loose and, and we're running the five minute mile. You remember some of those, you athletes over here, your five minute miles, right? Just, they're all in the past now, but uh, there was a day but it feels like that, just set free to run with him. Maybe even to take up wings and fly. <laughs> Discern the season you're in and, and welcome Jesus in for that deliverance that he promises to bring. God bless you, it's been good to worship with you this morning. Take a moment and practice some one another's among you. Let's be church together, and then let's scatter and continue all week long to represent Jesus to be the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.